was one of the um, basketball players for the faculty team. And um, <laughs> intramurals, <laughs> yes, um, in 1968. And that um, Dr. Mantai was, um, he started a really interesting program to have students go through the chemistry labs um, at their own pace. So um, I'm sure that that was very much appreciated. And um, they have so many awards between them, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to pass on the microphone because I know you need to hear them. Okay, well, thank you all for coming. We're, uh, we're almost, we're, I guess we're underwhelmed a little by their turnout, but uh, uh, apparently the video will be, be made available in about a week or so, and anybody can check it out. And, and share the, the, the wisdom that's going to come forth here. So I've, I've given this, this little presentation by Ken and me uh, a name. We can call this the uh, Grumpy Old Men's Tour. Uh, <laughs> probably the first and last appearance we have. So we, d we decided, we, Karen and I have been uh, independently taking notes as, as to the kinds of subjects, topics we would talk about. And uh, we shared them, and then Ken put them together in an organized fashion. So I suggested that we start with our first impressions of the, of the campus, when we, the first time we came to the campus. So since I'm starting with this, let, I'll let Ken start, and I'll, I'll, I'll chime in when, when he's finished. Do you want to have this? We hold this, hold this back and forth? Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, it's uh, interesting to be here. It's been five years since I've actually taught a class. You can't hear? Don't you have to push a button? Testing, testing. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to talk a little, but you, is this better? All right, it's been, it's been a while since I've been here, so I'm not used to the microphone or anything yet. The early impressions of campus, uh, when, when Bob and I were interviewed and came here and looked around, it was mostly sagebrush and, uh, and just dirt. Uh, there were just a very few original buildings, the, the uh, biology building, the chemistry building, the concrete was just still wet in that building, and the administration building was here. Uh, the smog was a lot worse, as you can imagine. There were no dormitories. There was a brand new parking lot out in front, and um, uh, I, I thought it was uh, pretty desolate. My first visit to the campus was not for an interview. I, I interviewed at a professional convention in snowy Toronto in December. But I did come out uh, in, in over Memorial Day weekend prior to the fall of 1968 when I started teaching. And the two, the two science buildings, the biological and physical science buildings, were not yet open then. They were still under construction. And you could, most of it was done, but still so. And the same thing, the only other building aside from the temporary buildings which have lasted and will outlast me, certainly, uh, are the was the uh, the old gym, what we call the old gym. And so that was gonna also would open in the fall. And otherwise, there were the three temporary buildings, what is now Chaparral Hall and uh, uh, Sierra Hall and the administration building. And, and that was the campus. Most of it was, the ground was brown and dry. There were still some vineyards on the campus. And I remember early on being taken by uh, then, I think, the dean of uh, admissions. Took, us, took me and someone else around, and we went and picked some grapes from it. Uh, it, was, it was really rustic. Plus, the city of San Bernardino was f much further away in the sense that it hadn't built up uh, the, all these apartment complexes and new homes that are around the campus. Nothing was there. There was uh, the uh, couple bars up down, down Kendall and, and some uh, rickety old houses in the area, and, and that was about it. Uh, and, then, and then people didn't even know about the campus. If I told people I was teaching at, at Cal State College, we were college then, yeah, San Bernardino, they said, the movie okay, good. Um, Ken took this movie, what, in 1967 or so? 69. 69, okay. So you get a sense from the, from the, from the, okay. Uh, at any rate, uh, the, the, it, was, it was all getting started. So people used to think this place, they mistook it for an extension of San Bernardino Valley College. Now, we've since established our own identity, but it took a lot of work. And I'm remembering, uh, I, think it was, I think it was 1972 or three. the local paper, the San Bernardino Sun, had a, a reporter who really wasn't friendly to the campus. And the Sunday paper led front page, big headline about this place and what was wrong with it. 
It was really a nasty piece, and he emphasized everything that was negative. Mm. And, I, and I, at the time, I, I held a temporary position of relations with schools officer. I stopped teaching for six months, and I visited all the high schools and community colleges in the, in the two county area. And I was trying to talk up the university, uh, the college, and, and, and the advantages. And I felt this guy was undermining what I was trying to do. So I, I wrote a response, a lengthy response, which appeared the following Saturday in the back of the paper. So. The newspaper had control of that. But again, it was um, a, a very different place, very small, hardly the, the, a feel for uh, a campus at all. Um, you could see more snakes on campus, some rattlesnakes, uh, tarantulas, come across those. Uh, coyotes, you can hear the coyotes if you couldn't see them. Yeah, so, uh, but we've grown, we've grown up over the decades, as, as a university should, and it's a, although it's a different place, there are, there are things that we miss from those earlier days, but then there are so many other advantages. Uh, so we have, we have uh, a, a number of, of, of topics. Uh, we can talk about some of our employment. Let me start out in saying, I don't think we're doing this anymore, and I don't think we've done this for a long time, but we had to take a, a loyalty oath. I had to come here and I had to swear allegiance to the state of California and the United States of America to make sure that I was not a subversive, not someone who's seek, coming here only for the purpose of overthrowing the government of the United States. And I always, I've always thought loyalty oaths were ridiculous because if I had such a purpose of un overthrowing the government, lying about it would be the least of the problems. So somewhere along the line, they, they, they did away with those. Did you still visit 1999? Not, really, as recently as 19, 1999. Wow, wow. Um, so there you go. Uh, let's see. Um, Ken had some, let me, let me pass it to Ken because I don't want to monopolize the whole thing. But we're talking about uh, phones. Uh, today, telephones, smartphones and the like are ubiquitous. Uh, everybody walks and talks to themselves and whoever's at the other end. Of course, there were no such phones. So if I want to make a phone call, what do I have to do, Ken? Back in those days, you'd find a phone booth. There weren't very many, but there were a few. But very few students used phones. Uh, we just didn't do that sort of thing. You, you didn't have to uh, use the internet. The the internet only really began in uh, uh, with browsing in 1993 with the first Mosaic program. We had embryonic connections to other campuses here in 1973. Um, I could sit. Our, our, we didn't have a laptops or anything. We had just a teletype. And I could sit at the teletype in the chemistry in physical science building, and uh, I was connected not internet not to everyone in the world, but to the other campuses. I think there might have been 18 campuses at that time, so I could put sort of embryonic email uh, in on, onto the listserv. It was more like a listserv today, and we would talk about the the basketball uh, sports and things like that. Uh, that was. That's the, uh, the, the phone calls and internet back those, those days, people were uh, more interested in classes and grades, I hope. Uh, we saw deer. Uh, I was in the physical science building. I keep forgetting about this. Uh, it, it, uh, it was about 7 o'clock maybe when I would finally get to leave and go home, and uh, deer were in the uh, drinking out of a fountain. Between the, the two buildings, there used to be drinking fountain there. As a matter of fact, that little clip you saw, uh, Roz was dr drinking out of a fountain that was in front of the chemistry building. Uh, I think maybe there were too many complaints that on a windy day, you just get a face full. And anyway, they pulled that fountain out fairly soon. When it rained, it was terrible in the early days. Uh, if you were in the biology building or the physical science because the the cement sidewalks didn't go that far and you had to negotiate little wooden planks to get around the campus in those days uh, through the mud. Makes us seem like pioneers, you know. Uh, after, the, after class, we'd go into the, sta the stagecoach and uh, head home. But um, uh, 
the number of things that were dramatically different that would be especially of interest to students is that class size was small. And there's, class size is still pretty good on this campus relative to, to other public universities. And, and many classes are, are quite small. I'm teaching a, a senior research seminar this quarter, so I'm still teaching. And I have two more years after this before I have to stop. And that'll, for me, it'll round out 50 years of teaching at Cal State, which uh, amazes me that, that time has gone by so fast. But uh, I have a class right now with seven people in it, which is wonderful for the, for the students. Could have held 15, just didn't work out that way. Maybe I scared them off, I, I don't really know. But 20 students was the normal maximum size for all classes except for a few large lectures that were in PS10 over there. Uh, and that was the only large lecture there was, and that was pretty good. Uh, on the other hand, whereas today, when we hire new faculty, I'm, I'm speaking from the, the perspective of uh, my department, the history department, but I expect it's similar in other departments, we give, them a we give new people a reduced load. They teach fewer classes the first year. Uh, we, we try to get them both integrated into the university and give them a head start on their professional career so they can succeed while they're here. When, that didn't happen, but once upon a time. Uh, we got no money to move, uh, all ex moving expenses, and I moved from, from the East Coast, from New York City. I uh, had, had to bear the burden of all that, not even a few dollars, uh, but a had to do that. And then from the first year on, uh, I taught a full load. A full load then, in the quarter system, three courses per quarter, it was tw 12 hours each year. Now that may not sound, each, I'm sorry, each, uh, each quarter uh, per week, and that may not sound like a lot, but uh, for me, uh, only one of the courses I was teaching out of, uh, I taught nine, six new pre six preps altogether. Only one of them I had taught once before. I had five new preps that first year, as well as trying to establish myself. I have no, I have no idea how I did that, but, but somehow I managed to do that. Now, I, I'm not upset that people today have it better. I think it's long overdue, and I'm very happy that our, our new faculty have that, that advantage. But the small class size has been a major contribution, I think, to the well-being of education that we provide here. And I'm a big supporter of that. My oldest son graduated here with a Bachelor of, of, of Arts, and he then went on, he was in the College of Business, and he went and got a, an, an MBA as well. So I'm definitely a supporter of the university from that perspective. But um, in addition to that, let's see, I had another thought. Uh, um, let's see. I know students had to, uh, we, we were given a monetary, um, of goal in terms of what students should pay for books per course. And it's going to shock you. $25 per course. Now, you didn't know we couldn't always meet that, it often exceeded it, but that just gives you a sense of the cost of books. And I remember uh, uh, some of the books I was requiring were going for, say, $12. And I thought that was outrageous. And today it's cheap. Um, and it's, but that's a product of the times. and. Um, and I'll give you an example of salaries, too. We didn't, we didn't talk about this. But um, uh, when I started here, uh, and we as faculty got a raise, my salary, which I thought was fantastic, I, I th it was $9,500 a year. And that was almost $10,000. And to me, $10,000 was middle class. My father never made more than $7,000 something or other. And immediately, I started out making more money than he. And I thought that was fantastic. I had, other, I had another job offer. But they told me, this was in New Jersey at the Rutgers University, one of their satellite campuses, that uh, they were paying $8,500. And it's more expensive to live there. And they said, well, you have, your wife's going to have to work. Uh, so uh, even though I had family back east, we decided to venture across the Mississippi and come to California. Ken, I'll turn it over to you. OK. Um, I want to tell you about registration. I think right now you're doing it online. And, uh, and maybe I have to, my wife keeps telling me to bring this up. Okay, I'll try to do that. Uh, I, I need to have some sort of a thermometer or something that, uh, you know, goes up in the background that's and shows me. Oh, that's my wife, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, it, the early days of registration was done in person before the quarter began, uh, just a day before the quarter began or two days before. And uh, students would show up at the gymnasium and walk inside. Of course, after you wait in line a little while, you walk inside the gymnasium, and all around the periphery were uh, little tables 
uh, kind of uh, flimsy tables loaded with cards and boxes and faculty. Each table was a different department. So there's anthropology, here's biology, and here's music, and here's chemistry, all around the gym. So you decide what class you want, you find the table, you walk over, and you say what class you want. They look in the bin and they see, oh yeah, we have three cars left, and you get them. And you have a package of cards. When you leave, you have to pay whatever your cards uh, turn out to cost. And then, when you go to class, you turn the cards in, and it was a very simple system. We do have high winds in San Bernardino on occasion, and I do remember one poor gal. She was just sitting outside the gymnasium. She'd finished paying. She had no cards. The high wind had caught them, and I think her cards were already in Mentone. <laughs> they just like that. But you have to have the cars to get into the classroom. I don't know how that worked out for her. The cost of textbooks was incredibly uh, much cheaper than now. I'd say one-tenth the cost of what the books are now. Um, well, here. Yeah, all right. you take a little yeah, a couple of things come to mind. The, um, I mentioned the number of courses that faculty taught. I, one of my colleagues told a story, uh, this senior, co senior colleague at the time, how he was talking to a legislator. And the, when the legislator found out that we taught 12 hours, he was, he was shocked that we were teaching 12 hours a day. And when he found out it was 12 hours a week, that was a whole different story. But he had no understanding of what that meant. 12 hours doesn't still, even for a week, doesn't sound like very much. But when the, all the effort in terms of preparation and grading and continued uh, research and such, it, it, that's a, that's a Pretty heavy load when you're expect when faculty members are expected to be productive, to do research, to publish, uh, as uh, we are. And depending on your field, if you're in the arts, you have to produce. So, so that that was very heavy, and it's much better that we're teaching a, a little bit less now. Although there is, I think, pressure by the central administration to get us to teach more, and I think that does not bode well for the quality of education in the CSU system. Another thing to keep in mind is Ken mentioned the registration in the old in the old gym. But before the registration was there, I think I was, we were here for the last time, it was in what was then the old library. So the first three buildings on the campus, as I said, were the administration buildings, Sierra Hall and Chaparral, uh, and Chaparral Hall. The um, library was in, on half of, of Sierra Hall, the, the side closest to the, the parking lot. That was all library. And the other half was classrooms and a, maybe a few administrative buildings. Where in, in Chaparral Hall, if you're familiar with, there's a, a, an open area, but that's partly closed in facing the administration building. Well, that was divided in two parts. On the left was the bookstore. On the right was the cafeteria, such as it was. Everything's very compressed. So, uh, but as a result of all that, because it was so small, uh, certainly among the faculty and staff, you, if, if you didn't know everybody, you knew everybody by sight, pretty much and you knew a lot of students. And I, I just, as it was mentioned, I was involved with uh, intramural basketball and softball and the like. So I got to meet a lot of students who were not in my classes, and, and that was a wonderful part of it. Um, it um, I, 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 there may still be intramurals, but it's been subordinated in many ways to the uh, intercollegiate athletics, which came much later. Uh, there was resistance to, inter to having intercollegiate athletics on campus because uh, the first president, John Fow, had come from the University of Chicago where they did not have intercollegiate sports. He wanted to emphasize participation, intramurals, and he thought that uh, there's always the problem of the, the dog wagging the tail, or the tail wagging the dog, as the case may be. And uh, now we're at Division Two. We started out Division Three. Um, seems to be okay. I I'm very happy that, although I've had uh, university athletes in my classes, uh, some have done very well and some not, but I've never had a coach come to me and ask me to do this or that to favor the student because I would be resistant to that. I think that's, 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 that's wrong. So here, I'll turn it over to Ken again. Don't forget, close to the mouth. Ooh, boy, it gets, makes louder. I usually project pretty well, so uh, I have no problem. Most of the time. I used to project, but uh, <laughs> now I'm just like a nail on the floor. I stick up more than I, yeah, if that's a projection. Um, I wanted to mention that the, the early campus mascot was not a coyote. Anybody know what it was? 
a couple, what was it? A uh, St. Bernard. Anybody remember Russell Dreamer? You remember Russell Dreamer? That was the guy we were trying to think of. We couldn't think of the name of this professor, or an early physics professor, and their dog, uh, he and his wife had a dog, uh, St. Bernard, that was the, the mascot. So what was the name of the school newspaper? You don't remember? The paw print. Okay, good. The paw, what is the name today? It's, it, it just hurt me. When, when, they changed, when they changed the name to some innocuous chronicle, what is chronicle? Why not have a little something and call it a paw print, you know? But uh, anyway, that's... Uh, it, it's chronic. The Coyote Chronicle. Okay, well, maybe that's okay. I, I wanted to mention that there were some complaints in uh, 1969. If you remember, that was kind of an active movement. There was a lot of hippie, anti-war rebellion. And, and uh, so the, the, from Berkeley, it trickled down here, and we needed free speech. The students were up in arms. We need a free speech area. So the president, John Fowle, uh, signed the, the check, and they put in a big semicircular, like uh, an, a, 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 an amphitheater, a very small amphitheater. And uh, this was designed for, for a free speech area that the students could come and, and uh, air their, their concerns. And you know, I went there one day after the inauguration. Uh, there was one famous student on campus that really never came here to study. He just used campus as a place to display himself. And he had a cross erected at the back when, while somebody was trying to do the presentation. And, uh, and he was, and I think it said grades. He had grades on a sign above. You know, he was being crucified on grades at Cal, St at Cal State. Uh, uh, by the way, it was Cal State College, not Cal State University. So it was CSCSB. And uh, so one of the physics professors had that as his license uh, uh, plate, CSCSB, uh, long after it changed to CSUSB. Um, you were going to mention SDS. Yeah. Um, in, uh, was it 1971 when the students at Kent State were killed? I think it was something around that time. Uh, and this was, as, as Kent said, it was a very, um, uh, it was a tumultuous time. 1968 was the year of... Uh, uh, of uh, a, a, a difficult presidential election, Nixon ran against Humphrey.